Now let's go ahead and turn to Luke 8, verses 22 through 25. This is the word of the Lord, our only rule for faith and for life. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. And they woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, pierce our hearts this morning, Lord, with your, with your holy word, that we may truly understand, and that understanding we may believe, and in believing, that we may follow in faithfulness and in obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do, through Christ our Lord. Amen. On July 25 and 26, back in 2020, uh, Corpus Christi, where I'm from, uh, was hit with Hurricane Hannah. You probably don't recall much about Hurricane Hannah. Um, it was a Category 1 storm, so most of us just stayed there. We didn't even board up our windows. Um, we were not worried about this hurricane at all, and rightly so because it brought a whopping five inches of rain to Corpus Christi. The hurricane did, however, have 90-mile-an-hour winds, and those winds brought along with them a storm surge. A storm surge is the large waves that come up, uh, and those were seven feet. Now, I'm six feet tall, so these are a pretty large storm surge, uh, and that's what did most of the damage in Corpus Christi. Now, Bob Hall Pier is a pier near the beach where my family uh, likes to go swim and, and hang out at the beach. Uh, sharks like tiger sharks, bull sharks, hammerhead sharks are frequently caught off of this pier where we swim. The pier was built in 1950, and it juts out into the bay 1,200 feet. Uh, it's made of reinforced concrete and steel, and the storm surge destroyed it. In 1986, two fishermen were fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and they discovered what is known as the Jesus Boat. During a drought, the sea level lowered, and they found this boat dating back to the first century A.D. Its size was 27 feet long by 7 1⁄2 feet wide. Now, to give you a perspective, that's about the size of a large U-Haul truck as far as width and length length goes. So when we talk about the disciples' boat, that's what I want you to consider, that size, 27 feet by seven and a half feet. And then I want you to see what a seven-foot storm surge would do to a wooden boat that's 27 feet long. So as we look at our miracle this morning, we're going to break our text down into three sections. The first will be the setup, how Jesus set up this whole miracle. And that'll be found in verses 22 and 23. And then the second portion will be the storm. And that'll be found in verses 23 and 24. And then finally, we'll look at the salvation, the redemption from this storm in verses 24 and 25. So let's begin in looking at how Jesus set up this miracle. This is verses 22 and 23 again. One day, he got into the boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. So why did Jesus do this? Right? Surely he knew what was going to happen, right? Jesus is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows what's coming. And yet he still suggests that they go to the other side of the sea. Right? This miracle happened because Jesus wanted to display his power uh, to his disciples and to those who read his account thousands of years later, as we do. This miracle also served to show that Jesus had the same amount of power as God did in the Old Testament. And now we're going to refer to Psalm 107. This is verses 23 through 30. I'll go ahead and read these. Uh, and as I do, what I want you to notice is how many similarities there are between Psalm 107 
and our passage this morning. Okay, there's a whole lot of, of similarities going on here. Psalm 107, verses 23 through 30. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered as drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them on to their desired haven. So if we look at verse 24 there, we see that the wind and the waves are only controlled by God. Right? So this miracle then testifies to Christ's divine nature. It testifies, it shows his disciples that Christ is God. Because what he's doing, only God can do. So the overall effect of this miracle filled the disciples with fear and wonder in the presence of the supernatural. Now, another possibility that Jesus likely had in telling them, let's go across the sea, was to get to the country of the Gerasenes, where Jesus would cast out this demon of the man of, that possessed a man. Now, it's important to note that the Sea of the Gerasenes is on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. The Mediterranean Sea is on the western side, and the Sea of the that Gerasenes is on the eastern side. This is very important. We'll get there in just a minute. All this begs the question then, how could God allow suffering and trials and sin, right? He's going to allow this storm to come up and threaten the disciples with their very lives. How could Jesus do this? This is a question I hear often. Right? If God exists, why is there suffering in the world? Why are there trials and tribulations? in the world, right? And I would like to address that um, this morning. Often, when a trial occurs, the very first thing people ask is, why is God doing this? Even those who don't believe in God, what is God doing? In November of 1975, uh, the freighter, the Edmund Fitzgerald, sunk with its crew of 29 men in Lake Superior. Uh, I was seven years old at the time, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I grew up in Chicago. And this was big news for us there. The following year, uh, musician Gordon Lightfoot wrote the song, um, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which contained this lyric. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? Lightfoot captured the sentiment of the United States, of our nation, by considering the love of God in the light of seemingly pointless tragedy. In his best-selling book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, Rabbi Harold Kushner comes to the ultimate conclusion that bad things only happen by chance. Kushner says this, residual chaos, chance and mischance, things happen for no reason. In which case, we simply have to learn to live with it, sustained and comforted by the knowledge that the earthquake and the accident, like murder and robbery, are not the will of God, but represent the reality which stands independent of his will. Kushner maintains that things happen outside of God's sovereign will. The number of evangelicals who agree with this just astounds me. In his final analysis, what Kushner and so many others believe is that God is unable to control the universe. God is impotent to stop this evil onslaught. This contradicts one of God's attributes, doesn't it? God's sovereignty, right? That God is sovereign over all. He is the cause of all things. God is the creator. He is the ruler. He is the owner of this universe. Nothing happens outside of God's will. Amen. Scripture flatly contradicts the viewpoint that many today have that adversity happens by chance. 
So if God is sovereign over any part of his creation, then ultimately is not sovereign over any part of his creation, then ultimately he cannot be God. God, by very definition, has to have absolute power over everything. So what we need to learn here is just because we don't see or imagine a good reason why something is occurring does not mean that there's not a good reason. Consider Joseph in the Old Testament. Right? He was sold into slavery by his brother. He was thrown into a pit by his brothers. Then he was sold into slavery. Right? He's sold to Potiphar's house where he's falsely accused of sexual harassment. He's wrongly imprisoned. And then he's left in prison, even though some people promised to help get him out. All of these terrible things are happening to Joseph. Were these things merely random? Did they occur merely by chance? Absolutely not. Think about Joseph's response to his brothers. This is Genesis 50, verse 20. It's one of my all-time favorite verses in all of Scripture. Joseph said this, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph understood that God used all of his pain and suffering for the ultimate good of his people. Trials, sin, and suffering do not occur separate from divine control and divine purpose. God's foreordination in regard to trials, sins, and suffering is permissive. In other words, God allows those things to occur. Romans 8 verse 28 tells us this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Note how Paul says all things. That's good things and that's bad things. So we need to realize then that God foreordains trials, sins, and suffering to come upon believers for different reasons. It produces perseverance. Suffering also works for the good of those who love God. Suffering in this story led to the disciples to confront one of the great questions of life, the question of who is Jesus? So this brings us to our second point this morning, the, the storm and this is found in verses 23 and 24. And a windstorm came down upon the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. And they went and they woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. So one of the, the frightening aspects here is if we look through Scripture, we see that any time there are storms occurring, they're bringing God's judgment with them, right? You look back at Noah, and the whole world was evil, and God grieved that he had made man, and so he sends this flood to destroy the world, but he saved one family, right? Or we look at the Israelites escaping from Egypt, and they escape through the Red Sea, and then what happens? The waters come back down, and they destroy the Egyptian army, again, a sign of God's judgment. Or Jonah, when he was on the boat and he was thrown overboard and the, the fish swallowed him up, suddenly the storm was calmed, the storm of judgment against Jonah. So storms typically are a sign of God's judgment. Now what about storms on the Sea of Galilee? Uh, the Sea of Galilee sits 680 feet below sea level. Uh, it's surrounded by hills, the steepest of which are on the side of the Gerasenes, the eastern side. So what happens is the winds come across from the Mediterranean, and then they go down into the Sea of Galilee, and then they hit those steep cliffs on the side of the Gerasenes. And that brings these huge windstorms, right? They've known, they've measured these to be anywhere from 7 to 10 feet tall. So that's what the disciples are dealing with. This is the area where storms occurred. Jesus knew that this was a place where frequent storms occurred. This, ma this miracle did not happen by accident. Jesus did this. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. Right? I imagine the disciples probably knew as well because they were seasoned fishermen and they fished on the Sea of Galilee and likely they knew what the waters were like 
on the side of the Gerasenes. This would be like knowingly taking your boat out into the Bermuda Triangle, right? You wouldn't do that. So Matthew calls, calls this storm a shaking of the boat, right? And Matthew's version of it, I think, is kind of weak. Luke, on the other hand, goes to the other extreme. He calls it a whirlwind, and the same word that is used for whirlwind in Greek is also used for hurricane. So on one side, we have a mild shaking of the boat, and on the other side, we have a hurricane. So likely, it's in the middle. It's a windstorm. Right? Clearly, it's severe. It's severe enough that the disciples, fishermen, are afraid that they are going to perish. The boat is swamped. This tiny 27-foot boat is being swamped by 7 to 10-foot swells, and they're afraid for their lives. Look at verse 24. And they went and they woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Now, if you consider what a seven-foot-tall storm surge did to Bob Hall Pier, a pier made of concrete and of steel, you can imagine what it would do to a wooden boat. This was not some little gale that caused the disciples to have mild concern. Right? This is a very serious matter. This story brings up the fundamental issue of life and of death. Psalm 69 verses 1 and 2 say this, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. Deep waters throughout scripture bring with them death. Now, with my apologies to contemporary Christian musicians and Christian pastors, the storm is not a metaphor for the storms of life. The storm is not about losing your car keys. It's not about your checkbook balance. It's not about your 13-year-old son getting in a fist fight at school over who sunk the Bismarck, hypothetically, of course. It's not about pinning your happiness on a particular political candidate. The storm is a matter of life and death. It begs the question, is God there and does he care? Is God there and does he care? Ever since the fall of man, man has been subject to the penalty of death. This storm presents a very intense, dramatic backdrop for the threat of physical death. And similar to physical death is spiritual death, eternal separation from God. So Jesus' miracle then is not merely a display of his power. It's also a display of how he saves his people from spiritual death. He works this miracle for all who are struggling with the concept of death. If Jesus is able to calm the threat of death, how much more is he able to calm death itself? Jesus calmed the threat of death when he calmed the storm. Jesus calmed actual death when he was resurrected. So is God there and does God care? In Mark's story, the disciples ask Jesus, don't you care if we drown? Seriously, they've been hanging out with Jesus for several years. Of course he cared. They were great friends. What a silly question. That would be like my children coming to me 10 minutes before dinner and saying, Dad, don't you care if we starve to death? Right? No. Of course Jesus cares. Right? The Gordon Lightfoot quote would be very appropriate, being asked by the disciples here. Where is the love of God now that the waves are turning the minutes to hours? The disciples believe that Jesus is going to sleep on them in their hour of greatest need. But actually, it's the other way around. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they're the ones that fell asleep on him. They truly abandon him, and yet he loves them until the end. Psalm 46, verse 1 tells us, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. So in answer of our question, yes, God is there. And he loves us and cares about us enough about the penalty of death to go through death himself 
and arise victorious over it. The same God who conquered the storm conquered death itself. This very same God loves us to the very end. So now let's look at the resolution of the storm, the, the salvation that Jesus brings. This is verses 24 and 25. And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Now if you notice here, Jesus makes two rebukes, doesn't he? The first thing he rebukes is the wind and the waves. He rebukes them and there's a calm, right? Not only did the storm cease, scripture tells us it was calm. So it didn't go from large waves down to choppy seas, down to rough seas, down to calm seas. Christ spoke and it was calm. So they went from seven feet to placid that fast. Christ spoke and it was calm. But the second rebuke that Jesus makes is to the disciples. He rebukes them for having no faith at all, not for having no faith at all, but for lacking faith. Jesus was more committed to his disciples than perhaps they realized. He calmed the cause of their fear. Now what they didn't grasp is that their fear vanishes when it is replaced by faith in Christ. Our fear vanishes when it is replaced by faith in Christ. So what areas then do you struggle with this morning? What are you afraid of? What have you filled with fear this morning? What are you worried about? Finances or employment or relationships, addictions. What areas do you need to replace your fears with faith in Christ? I would encourage you today to pray about those things and do your business with God about those things. Commit your fears to him. Now, as, as we have previously discussed, Jesus rescued the disciples from the storm. This rescue also pointed beyond the waters to the larger issue of death. The miracle symbolizes Jesus rescuing those that he loves from permanent death. And the death from which he res rescues them encompasses not merely physical death, but spiritual as well. Through him, we are all united in fellowship with God, who is the source of true eternal life. So how do the disciples respond then to, to Christ's calming of the sea? Verse 25 tells us that the disciples' fear changed from being afraid of the storm to being afraid of Jesus. And they said, and they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the wind and the water, and they obey him? The disciples were forced to confront one of the questions that all of us ultimately have to face, and that is, who is Jesus Christ? We all have to come to face that question at some point in our lives. Several years ago, I was a, a campus minister at Texas A&M in Corpus Christi, and one of the things I decided to do one day was I took a, an easel out to the middle of campus, and I put a dry erase board on it, and I laid some dry erase markers in front of it, and I wrote on the, the dry erase board, who is Jesus? And then I left. And I came back a couple hours later to see what people had written. And it, it was very interesting. Most people had written, he was a good man. Well, that's a safe bet, right? He was man, he was God, so he, he was good, right? That's not going to offend anybody. Other people wrote, he was a great moral teacher. One person wrote, he is the son of God. One person. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, addresses the student sentiments Right When they say he was a good man or he was a great moral teacher, this is what C.S. Lewis says. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. 
That is one thing that we must not say, says Lewis. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would be not be a great moral teacher. He would be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that door open to us. He did not intend to. So when we read through the things that Jesus said and did throughout the New Testament, we can only come to one of three conclusions then. That Jesus is either a lunatic, or he's a liar, or he's our Lord. So for our sake, Jesus, the Son of God, suffered death. And now that he's been raised, his new life not only brings him to us personally, but also to those of us who believe in him. Romans 4 verse 25 tells us that he was delivered up for our transgressions, for our tras trespasses, and raised for our justification. Jesus faced the storms of death because that's what our sins required. He was raised to life in order that new life might be given unto us. In that new life, we serve with praise and give glory to our God. Jesus, says Tim Keller, faced the storms of death and endured it for you so that you can know that he will not abandon you in your infinitely smaller storms. Why not trust the one who did that for you? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for what it tells us about Jesus calming the storm. Lord, and how if he can calm the, st the storm of, of death, of physical death, that he can calm any storm. Lord, that we don't need to worry about the small, minor squalls in our lives. That we don't have to worry about the little rainstorms that come our way. We know Jesus can handle it all, all the way through death. So Lord, be with us this week. Remind us that Jesus has conquered all of our storms, that he has conquered physical death, and that he has conquered spiritual death, that we may spend eternity with you. It's in his name we pray. Amen.